Welcome. We're talking with Professor Ari Kelman of the University of California, Davis. If we could, if we could back up to chapter two on, on the, the sort of classic steamboat era, um, there's, there's a lot in, in this because it really sort of covers the kind of the, well, certainly the rise of, of steamboats and it, it sort of wraps up kind of just before the yellow fever uh, outbreak in 1853. So it really covers the, the golden age of New Orleans commercially. And it, it covers a lot of different things and I won't go into everything, but I was particularly interested in the, the character of Henry Shreve, who's a very interesting guy. And one of the things that struck me about this was he, he seems to very much become sort of the hero of the people in New Orleans who opposed the Fulton monopoly, who wanted free access to the river and, and free travel uh, on, on the river, as, as opposed to the, the government sort of deciding for people that giving this monopoly would be the best thing for the public uh, by just sort of boosting, boosting things. And I was just sort of curious about some, some further thoughts about what is it about Henry Shreve that makes him so easy to sort of construct as this sort of heroic character, especially considering that he's not a New Orleanian, it, but is that sort of part of the appeal as well? And also, how does he relate to this whole tradition of sort of Mississippi River heroes like Mike Fink and the, the raftsmen and all that sort of stuff? So, uh... Let me deal with the, the last part of that first. Um, there is no question that someone like Shreve uh, ends up um, being cast in the popular imagination as uh, sort of a heroic uh, river figure. Um, having said that, he and, and Mike Fink and, and others, I think are, uh, are quite different in the sense that Fink and others are, are really uh, anti-authority figures and, and Shreve is, um, is part of what I think of a different strain of, of hagiography in the United States. And, and that's the way in which uh, Americans, and actually I think this is to some extent true in the UK as well, uh, fetishize entrepreneurs, um, fetishize the, the self-made man who overcomes uh, whether it's environmental or regulatory obstacles um, and opens up opportunity. Uh, this is um, in the United States, uh, a, a trope that's repeated again and again in the American West. Uh, the way in which the, the sort of rugged entrepreneur uh, moves into the West, tames the, the wild landscape, or in this case, the wild riverscape, and, and makes it possible for whether it's a desert to bloom or civilization to flourish or river or, or riverboats to go up and down stream uh, is, is something of an open question. Um, but but it, it takes many guises. Um, and Shreve, I think, fits very, very neatly uh, into that kind of what I think of as a as a cultural history or an American studies approach of understanding these American archetypes. Um, and, you know, I, I, as it happens, he's a much more complicated figure. Uh, and, um, and, and as is often the case with these sorts of figures, whether they're, whether they're uh, aligned with authority or they're anti-authority, they're, they're almost always getting a huge boost from the federal government. Um, whether it's in the form of monopolies or contracts or otherwise, uh, the, the notion of rugged individualism in the United States sits at the core of American exceptionalism, and, and it's almost never true. We have very, very few truly rugged individuals in the United States. The people that we tend to associate with this, as I say, almost always are, are being given a, a, a significant leg up by either uh, state, local, or, or federal authorities, the, by the state, capital T, capital S. Um, and, and Shreve is, uh, fits with that, uh, with, with that as well. Yeah, in, in, in some ways you could sort of look at James Eads as a similar sort of character who for, for a long time is, is very much on the outs with the, the New Orleans establishment. They, they want a canal. 
He's insisting on these jetties. He gets congressional authority to do that and then sort of does the jetties and, you know, is, is more or less the, the hero, um, or at least, you know, they, they are, are happy enough to have the river opened. Um, but a similar sort of thing, an entrepreneur who then, you know, the only way he gets his stuff done is with really big government help. Yep. Uh, and that's a pretty common thing in the West. Um, it's maybe even more obvious in the West. Yeah. Um, so an, another question about this is that the story of, of this period particularly is, is this idea of New Orleans uh, situation being a, a natural advantage that the, all of the commerce of the center of the country has to flow through New Orleans and so forth. Uh, and the, the sort of local commercial leaders are, are going to sort of control nature and turn that towards their benefit and so forth. But if leaders in New Orleans thought they could control nature and sort of use it to their commercial advantage, why didn't they think that the people building railroads to go from west to east um, and bypass the Mississippi River and bypass New Orleans, did it not occur to them that these other people could do the same thing? So it, it's, again, there's, 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 it's a two-part answer. Uh, one um, is, uh, I think, maybe more interesting than the other. So let me do the less interesting answer first. The, the less interesting answer is that it was a failure of imagination uh, and, and a kind of a wish fulfillment fantasy, right? That, that I think that there were uh, entrepreneurs in New Orleans, there were commercial elites, uh, Dubot and, other, and others who, who, who understood that railroads were in fact a pressing threat to the city uh, and who wanted New Orleans to, to get in on the railroad boom but who understood if they were thinking clearly that, that the, the, the route by rail from New Orleans to the Northeast or elsewhere was gonna be long and difficult to traverse. Uh, and so uh, they, they, in some instances were shouted down and others they did their best and it just didn't work out. And then as I say, there's this third larger group of people who were rhetorically very powerful uh, and also quite powerful in terms of their control of the, of the actual levers of municipal governance, um, who, like I said, they just simply, they, they, they failed to reckon with the reality of, of change. And that's, a, a, again, quite an old story, that, that incredibly powerful newspaper barons in the United States were extremely late to understand, this is as recently as 10, 20 years ago, what the internet was going to mean uh, and are now living with the consequences of that and trying to play catch up. Um, so people who have a great deal of power uh, tend to resist thinking too deeply about the way in which change can imperil uh, them and, and theirs. Uh, so the second, I think, potentially more interesting thing is that um, there were, in fact, a great many people who believed deeply in the idea of natural advantages and who saw the, the layout of the landscape as an expression of God's will um, and, and who saw uh, railroads as being unnatural um, and as being an affront to the Almighty. Um, there's a there's a wonderful book uh, by, a, I believe he's a German scholar named Wolfgang Schivelbusch called The Railway Journey, um, which is really about the psychology of early rail travel and the way in which the experience of traveling by rail shifts people's understanding of themselves and where they sit in the world around them. In, in a way that might be akin to, to or at least analogous to uh, how we all, if we think about it, understand that the experience of, of an astronaut viewing planet Earth from space shifts our sense of, of our place in the cosmos. All of a sudden, we, we see the planet from space. We see it as a small globe rather than as being something on which we're, we're situated. We, we can't even see beyond the horizon line normally. Uh, so Schivelbush makes those kinds of arguments, but, and, and, but one of the things that he, he talks about is the ways in which early rail uh, journeys were suffused with anxiety because this was a, 
a machine that was considered unholy, ungodly. And, and so there are many, many New Orleans who genuine, New Orleanians, I, sh I should say, who genuinely believe that the layout of the landscape, that the map, that the, the funnel shaped nature of the Mississippi system is a, is a true expression of the Almighty's preference for New Orleans. Um, where I have issues with that is then why doesn't Cairo, Illinois, which should be pronounced Cairo, but uh, the people of Cairo want to differentiate themselves from, from uh, uh, residents of the Middle East. Um, why doesn't Cairo, Illinois then also uh, blossom into this sort of commercial preeminence? Because if, if you've ever been to Cairo, it's, it's where the Missouri uh, meets the Mississippi. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's two of the, the, I guess, eight longest rivers in the world and, and certainly the, the largest and most significant on the continent. Uh, and if you've ever been there, it's, it's um, I, I won't swear in front of your students, but it's, it's, it's a garbage fire. How much to it, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a filthy backwater um, that has always been uh, just an absolute mess. It never had a moment of, of, uh, of commercial prominence. And so it, it, for, for someone who isn't interested or, or for someone who, would, who, would, who views environmental determinism as problematic and is obscuring more than it reveals, you want to do a comparison, right? So you put New Orleans side by side with Cairo and you say to yourself, well, this one did well, this one didn't do well, what's the difference? And the answer isn't that New Orleans has better natural advantages. It doesn't. It, it's worse. Mm -hmm. The answer is that Cairo had lousy governance and less investment and, and that it didn't have a cotton economy and that it, and, and on and on and on and on and on. It didn't have slavery for as long or for as significantly to serve as a kind of trigger for capitalist development. And, and you can just, you can look at a variety of different explanations that are not related to the natural environment, but people in the 19th century weren't doing that kind of analysis for the most part. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, and uh, as I say, of, of all of the chapters, that one I think covers the most ground in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we could, if, if I were to impose on, on your time, we could talk about that um, all evening. Um, I think that's, those are the main sort of things I'd sort of thought of al already. Um, is there anything, any last bit that you would want to say about, about the book, about New Orleans, about, I mean, we've sort of talked about hurricanes. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I um, uh, well, first I'll apologize to your students. I'm sorry that they had to slog through the, the, the book. Um, second, I would just say that uh, I actually think that we, we touched on the, on the great shortcoming of the book, which is that it doesn't, it doesn't treat uh, the institution of slavery with the, with the seriousness, uh, and, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't place it as centrally. Um, as it should have, e economically, culturally, socially, um, it, it, the institute to, to, to think about New Orleans without grappling with slavery as, as potentially the preeminent analytical lens that one is using, uh, I, I think is a, is a real missed opportunity. Um, and so I think it, it, it's, very, it's, it's helpful that we talked about that. Um, and so beyond that, I'll just say again, I apologize, but also thanks uh, to your students. Um, uh, I, I, I have been extremely fortunate uh, in recent years um, and professionally, uh, but it never stops being in both uh, touching and also surprising to me that people read my work. Um, we, we write these books, for the most part, we write them uh, instrumentally. We're trying to get tenure or trying to get jobs, but we hope that people will read them. Um, but for the most part, people do not. Uh, and, and when it turns out that, that students who I recognize are a captive audience, um, but when it turns out that, that people are reading the books, that students are reading the books, it is, it's tremendously meaningful. So thank you all very, very much.